So welcome Facebook. We are now live on Facebook and today's webinar is number three in the Travel Tricks webinar series. And today we are going to have a chat about Machu Picchu in Peru. I'm Josh. This is Matt. Hi. Let's get into it. So we we say this, um, we're going to say this pretty much every time we do the webinar. When you go somewhere, you should have a plan. Uh, you should also have a backup plan as well. And the backup plan, you need to consider uh, a lot of the risks that you might have in going uh, to where you're going. Um, within that backup plan or within your plan in general, you should have some escape routes. They can actually be part of your alternative plan also. So, uh, for example, Josh and I were recently in Scotland, Glen Affric, on the hills. Um, lots of cold conditions and very deep snow. Josh got an injury and um, I had to get him off. He, he took himself off and we had to change the plan. And uh, there is um, a cool article that, um, that I wrote on that subject, if you're, if anyone's interested, um, around dealing with injury in remote regions. Um, you can find that on our blog page and our website. Um, it's just about how to uh building procedures so that if something like that happens and it what you're doing is inherently um it's not high risk but it, there are risks as, attached to it so you have to have robust procedures so that so if something like that does happen you can you can fall back on those um, and deal with it um get yeah. out points get yourself off the hill that kind of stuff so check that out if you're interested um it's a good read i think yeah, it is. And because of Josh's experience and our experience as leaders, uh, what could often be a very stressful um, situation was not really a stressful situation. It just things happened. Um, we had the coping mechanisms in place and we got off the hill. So, so always have a plan. Um, make sure you've got escape routes. So if you need to, uh, for example, say, um, we're going to talk about this a bit later on, but say that your transportation has been shut down because of a political uprising and the trains have stopped. What are the options do you have? If you haven't thought of that beforehand, especially if you go to a country uh, which is still developing or, or currently has or has recently had issues, then um, you need to think about it. So, you know, you're taking the train out of that city, going to another one. For whatever reason, all the trains are now completely stopped. What else have you got? Having something in the bag is just brilliant. If you haven't and you have to plan on the spot and look around for resources, you could be wasting time, you could be wasting money um, and energy that could be placed in um, a more important spot to, to keep yourself happy and safe along your route. So always consider whenever you make a plan to go anywhere, that you have that plan and a backup plan and you've considered emergency situations on your journey as well. Let's get into it. What do we know about Peru and uh, Machu Picchu? So um, let's talk about Peru generally. Um, over 70, fun facts we'll start off with, we'll keep it light and then we'll get into the real interesting stuff um, about Machu Picchu in particular. Um, but over 70% of the world's alpaca population live in Peru. Um, it's a member of the camel family, um, they are related species. Um, and alpaca wool comes in 22 different natural colours. Um, and that's used widely in textiles. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll get into that a, uh, a little bit later, um, how it's used. Um, and if you want an education on the alpaca of Peru, watch The Emperor's New Groove from Disney. Yeah, it's very thorough. <laughs> Highly entertaining. Yeah. Um, ponchos. So kind of related to alpaca are the wonderful Peruvian ponchos. Most people who go to Peru buy a poncho and then never wear it. <laughs> it's just something you have to do. <laughs> I think Dick David did the same thing. I did that. Um, but it's cool because it means while you're out, I mean, Peru is a developing country, so it means you're supporting very, very small local business. So you're, you're spreading wealth and that's never a bad thing. Yeah. You're sharing the love. And they're also a lot more difficult to get pickpocketed in if you're wearing one. 
So I'll we'll come exactly. to that a bit later. Pickpocket well. armor. That's right. Yeah. As well as you know, fashionable and funky colors. The colors are brilliant, aren't they? Like so funky. You just have to have one. It's one of those things yeah. where like you're gonna buy it. It's gonna end up in the bottom drawer in your bedroom. And it's never going to come out again. But every time you see it covered in dust and mothballs, you're going to be like, oh, that was a really cool invention. Remember that time? Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, they are usually quite... What I love about Peruvian clothing is that the the colours are bold, very bold indeed. And you'll, um, depending on the region you're in, they'll have slight variations um, in their clothing, in their hats, which some regions like Trilby type things, um, and it, it it changes, but the main consistent thing is that they are loud, lots of sequins, lots of colours. It's pretty great. Sport and ponchos. Yeah. Amazon River is, of course, in Peru, second longest river in the world, and um, we will talk about this in another webinar. But we spend an incredible uh, week or two, depending on uh, what kind of trip you go out on us with, with us on. Um, where we hang out with some indigenous people on an island in the middle of the Amazon, and it is, it's unbelievable. It's it's really something else. But we'll come on to that um, in a later webinar. <laughs> um, so uh, it does contain one of the seven wonders of the world, um, and every year, roughly one point five million people travel to Peru uh, to visit Machu Picchu. Um, and it is believed to be significant in Incan history. We'll, we're going to delve right into that in just a moment um, about the history of it um, and uh, how it was built, uh, you know, what grows there. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Mm. I've, I've done the Inca Trail and Peru four times now. And um, it isn't getting boring. And after being to all the countries in the world that um, we've been to, um, the Machu Picchu and the trails, although it's a tourist trail, which I'm generally not um, not excited about the tourist trails uh, most of the time, this one is worth doing. So we're going to get into it, but um, consider, uh, or hopefully or this will excite you about thinking about doing the Machu Picchu trails and seeing the, the ancient city because it is very awesome to see. I mean, it is easily one of the best places I've ever been to. Yeah, yeah. I love historical sites. So I love history, it's, it, and it's, it's perfect for that. Yeah. You think, oh, this is really ancient. It's not. Um, it, it's relatively recent. That means it's still fresh. There's still a lot of knowledge around there. There's, a lot of the guides there are Quechua speaking, which is the the. Uh, so we it was it was the Europeans who called um, the Incas the Incas, which translates as kings, kings I believe, because the Incas were emperor, um, but they were called the Quechua people, which is the name of their language, um, and those guides do speak Quechua, so it's very real, it's very immersive. Yeah, and um, I mean the people. It's funny, like. In the West, we talk about how Bingham discovered uh, Machu Picchu. He didn't discover it. Um, there were people farming on Machu Picchu when he rocked up. All that happened was he asked where ancient structures were, and they told. Well, they took him there. So, and then of course he comes back to the the Royal Geographical Society in London and says, "I've made the greatest discovery." He probably had a moustache like mine, actually. Mm. Yeah. It was Yale, though. Was it Yale? Yale. Okay. Yale. Yeah, that one. Um, anyway. It's, um, we'll get a bit more into that as well, but like Josh said, it's it's quite a it's quite a recent um, uh, structure. It's not it's not like the pyramids, you know, that could be more than five thousand years old, um, which are also very very cool. Uh, pyramids are awesome, but Machu Picchu is it has a <clears throat> it has a spirit about it. It has a magic around it that you really feel when you're there, especially if you go through the Sun Gate. At sunrise instead of um, piling in with the thousands of people uh, during the daytime. But we'll talk about that as well a bit later. So uh, Peru is home to the potato. Um, that's where it came from. That's its native range. Um, Peruvians first discovered uh, wild potatoes on the shore of Lake Titicaca um, it's over 10,000 years ago, so a super long time ago. Um, and there are over 4,000 varieties 
um, growing just wild in the Peruvian highlands. And I know uh, another fun fact for you, potato related fact, um, when we brought potatoes back to the UK, people kept uh, making loads and loads of different breeds or varieties. And I think there could maybe be a reason for that, possibly. Maybe it was tax related. I can't remember now. Um, but um, they actually banned the breeding of new breeds mm. because it was it was getting out of hand, apparently. Well, there are like, what is it, 4,000? Different types of potato in Peru. Yeah, those are those are wild speed, uh, different uh, yeah. variations, and a lot of them are very discernible as well because mm. the colours are vast and wide. You get purple ones and yellow ones and black ones and red ones and shade every shade in between. So, um, yeah, it's quite amazing. And we've seen um, the Peru the Peruvians digging for potatoes, and they go out onto the the uh, hillsides a lot. It's quite high altitude above 2,000 metres, and they dig into the grass, and they're just under the surface, and they, they dig them up, and they light a fire in the ground, and then they'll basically bake them uh, there and then. It's, it's cool. It's cool to see them still working in those traditional ways. So when you've got that pesky potato plant growing out of your compost patch, which is a thing, um, burn it. Get some sludge <laughs> out of it. <laughs> Get some baked potatoes. Get some baked potatoes out of it. Yeah. So, um, so translation for Machu Picchu. What did you come up with on that? So it means um, so Machu Picchu refers to the mountain itself rather than the complex built upon it. Um, and the mountain. So Machu means old uh, or old person. It translates to in Quechua, but old. And then um, uh, Picchu means pyramid or possibly three-sided conical structure. Um, but I think pyramid is kind of a, a rough translation. Mm. Um, recent um, radiocarbon dating um, that went on in 2021, uh, I believe, um, revealed that Machu Picchu had been occupied from only um, uh, 1420 until 1530 so very recently and for a very short amount of time mm. i guess part of that is down to the conquistadors and the, the spanish interference and all the diseases that came through with that as well yeah so um so the the spanish came through well spanish travelers came through first before the conquistadors and with them they brought chicken pox um, and that wiped out a huge, um, huge amount of the population. Mm. Uh, I think we, um, we're we still discovering so much um, structures still in um, the Amazon jungle, in, in, in the Amazon forest in particular, mm. um, that gives us a, a better understanding of the scale of the size of this empire. Yeah, um, some of the uh, priests that made recordings as they travelled through the Amazon they recorded um, vast cities on the on the river banks of the tributaries and the Amazon itself, and they said the populations were um, vast, absolutely huge populations of people, which is incredible to think about that such a, a large amount of people subsisted in the jungle for that long, and mm. and then of course obviously the the chicken pox and then smallpox and mm. it just it destroyed more than 90 percent of the population of the amazon so it's quite incredible and then on top of that um there was a civil war in the incan empire um between two brothers and that um further um disrupted the um the empire and then finally when the conquistadors came um in the 16th century um the empire was pretty much in ruins anyway, um, and it was much easier for them to, to conquer with only 168 men and a few horses. And what was it two cannons? No, a couple of cannons. It was barely anything. Yeah, um, yeah the, the story you can read uh, a lot of the stories in some really good books. Uh, we'll try and find them actually, and then we'll put them in the in the, put them in the description. In the description. Um, 
cool. I did have that book, but it was actually stolen from me, which is a shame. But it was a brilliant book when I was reading one of them about the the ancient Incas and and what happened to them, and also how they uh, defended their own people and the Inca who was the emperor, and uh, the way they also committed like suicide, basically in lots of different ways when um, like either their generals were killed or uh, when the Inca was killed and, and things like that. So um, yeah, very fascinating. The construction of the place is also really interesting. When you go up there, and it's like a basalt uh, mountain, and it's all fractured and broken around Machu Picchu. And what they actually did was they took the materials that were there and then just organized them. So there's over 200 buildings at Machu Picchu. And if you look outside of the Machu Picchu kind of border, the walls, it's just chaotic landscape of just rock and rubble everywhere. And then in the town, in the city or the complex itself, it's very incredibly well organized. But there's also um, stones there, megaliths of incredible size, uh, some of them tens of tons, you know, probably up to 80 odd tons. And they have been moved and fashioned and manipulated and then placed and it, if you see it and think about it, it just it's mind boggling to watch what what's also in addition to that really impressive is that these massive stones um none of them were moved with the aid of the wheel they were all this is well, archaeologists uh, um think to be true is that mm. they're all moved manipulated by by just a really large workforce Whatever the method was, it's yeah, it's pretty impressive. So, so um, it was built by over the span of two um, Incan or yeah Incas emperors um, from 1438 to 1493, um, and uh, the kind of consensus among ar archaeologists is that it was built for uh, a royal estate. Um, and likely after the end of a successful military campaign. Um, um, so the arch like Matt was saying, the architecture is uh, adapted to the mountain. So um, uh, if you see photos of it, it, it is plonked right on top of this long, um, flattish topped mountain. And then you've got a, a big conical rise of uh, Machu Picchu mm. behind it. The flat top of the mountain is actually quite unique because when you look around the landscape, it's almost like uh, Chinese karstification features of these towers, like really, really steep sided. You're looking at, you know, 60, 50, 60, 70 degree sided uh, peaks all around, and then it drops into these uh, river valleys below. So it also looks like the mountain was actually fashioned in quite a severe way to get the flat top that they were using. Or... Maybe it was just a flat top and they saw that and thought that's a perfect place to build. But one of the things I really love is on the tiered steps at Machu Picchu where they were planting uh, their crops, they were actually experimenting with depth of soil and thickness of the walls made out of basalt so that during the day, the sunlight would be absorbed and the heat would be absorbed into the tiers through the basalt rock. And then during the night time, when obviously there are altitudes, so the temperature difference would be quite high. When the temperature dropped, the basalt would emit that heat back into the soil and stop the crops from uh, dying. And there are facilities around Machu Picchu, which you can walk on the Inca Trail or one of the Inca Trails and uh, see these uh, places where they were experimenting with depth of soil, thickness of the beds, thickness of the walls, to actually get it right so that it could grow low altitude plants at high altitude. Mm. And that is very, very cool. Yeah, it's very clever. Now, so mm. on, on, on these, these terraces is, is what they're called. Um, so a little bit about the, the kind of climate on, on the mountain, um, because it is, you might think, well, if it's so high up on a mountain, how are they going to get consistent rainfall um, for growing crops? Um, and it sits between, um, in its own climate really, in between the um, the Amazon tropical region and the higher Andes. So it's in cloud forest. And because of that, it rains a lot. So um, irrigation is never, it was never needed. Um, so the, the terraces are constructed in a way more for drainage than anything else. Um, so you'd have these, this step system of uh, terraces 
Um, and in each terrace, you'd have uh, the, they do it in layers. So the, the bottom layer would be great big boulders, and then they would have um, shingle type, you know, smaller stones on top, like gravel. And then they would have sand, and then they would have um, soil, uh, but really nutritious soil, so likely pulled up from the bottom of the valleys where there's but most vegetation, um, where all the nutrients will kind of fall into a sump. So they dragged that up there, and that's what they grew their their crops on. Um, so um, we know from uh, looking at the the diets of of, of the inhabitants um, of uh looking at i suppose you know remains of people left there the diet's largely composed of maize potatoes um grains and fish um but we know that largely in these terraces it was mainly uh potatoes and maize that were grown now there were we think 750 um plus people living on in this um on this estate this complex if you like um and for the amount of farming space that is there um there isn't enough for um to sustain that that population so there was a lot of um uh, fish brought in from elsewhere there was uh from elsewhere in the empire um to sustain the sustain the people the other really cool thing, when you walk around Machu Picchu, you can see on the side of the mountain a line that goes down the mountain at a diagonal towards the, the city, and that's an irrigation um, a pipe. It's a half pipe, actually. It's not a, it's not a full round pipe, so it's not covered. It's open. And uh, Machu Picchu didn't have its own uh, water at all. So apart from rainwater, which they could obviously capture, um, they actually uh, diverted a stream further up, way up behind Machu Picchu in the mountains. And I think it's like four kilometers mm. or more. And they cut out of the mountain and polished, not just cut, but they put, cut it and polished it. A half a half pipe, it's kind of like a, it, get in front of the camera, it does that and then it's like a half circle. And it's, they, it's not big, is it? It's, it's not big. It's, it's only about it's only about that deep. Yeah, it's probably yeah. like um, three or four centimeters deep, and yeah, it's almost the same wide. And they had this channel that went down through the mountains and then went into Machu Picchu, and it actually goes along the battlements of um, a fortress, which is up the mountain. And if you walk the Inca Trail, you pass through it, and you can learn the stories. And that's just very, very cool. Um, it's it's brilliant to see. That's just part of your kind of experience when you're at Machu Picchu and it amazes you. And, you know, your guide might say, oh, look up there and see this uh, line on the mountain. That's actually a water irrigation channel where they're moving water from several kilometers away down into Machu Picchu. And it's not it's not just in Machu Picchu. It's done at Oliantambo as well and other places around the Sacred Valley where they couldn't get water up in the tops of the peaks, they would pipe it. Uh, and it's, it's quite a construction. It's quite impressive. So onto the buildings themselves. Um, there are quite a few different temples. Uh, there's a temple to sun god. There's, um, a, con a, condor. there's a condor. Um, um, so a little bit about that is a shrine to the condor. And the condor is a sacred bird. You are extraordinarily lucky if you get to see some of uh, them in fly over you. Um, massive, great big birds. Um, I was lucky enough to see a pair fly over um, while I was there, which was very, very lucky indeed. And they are quite endangered now, unfortunately. Um, but this, the shrine of the condor is um, it's actually just a, a rock. Um, and it hasn't been carved in any way. It's just a natural rock formation that looks like a condor. Um, and that's, you know, that was enough for them to think this this should be a shrine to that. Um, this is that's where they conduct um, sacrifices. You might think, oh, human sacrifices. But that's that's not really something that the Incas did. Um, largely, these kind of sacrifices were um, animals or even soil. Um, and there is. Um, underneath the the rock itself there's grooves cut out um that patch blood 
and then blood would flow into these grooves and then collect in a bowl that would be an offering for yeah for the gods yeah um the other thing that's really cool about Machu Picchu is there's a there's a Pachamama um sign there you can look up the Pachamama sign maybe we'll chuck a picture up uh the Pachamama is um it's almost like an eight-sided um step and it's mm. it's reflected in itself with a hole in the middle and when you go to Machu Picchu there's half of one of those sitting on the sun temple mm. and at the winter solstice the sun shines on that perfectly to make a reflective shadow of the top of the Pachamama symbol to the bottom of it. And the Pachamama basically is a symbol of Mother Earth. And it was one of their biggest, like, worshipping and kind of, like, rec recognisable um, deities that they, they look to. And the cycles of the Earth and the stars. and They were incredible uh, astronomers. Yeah, they were absolutely. So th there's all the whole lot of... Um, folklore around that and it's really wonderful to read up on that so if you do go to Machu Picchu I definitely recommend that you read um, a book or two on it before you go it will really uh, enrich your experience because there's so much to learn there's just too much to learn so one trip there um, won't uh, excuse me won't get you um, the information that you could have when you go so and there are limitations on how long you can spend there. We'll, we will come on to that in just a moment um, about the, uh, what a trip would actually look like to Machu Picchu. Um, so, yeah, definitely. The, the guides are amazing um, and they do bring, you know, stories to life. Um, but it, it would be great to build on a foundational knowledge of, of the place itself. Let's get, in, let's get into the visit because um, we've talked quite a bit about the history. And, and to be honest, we, we could do a whole webinar just on historical facts and 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 things like that about it. So let's let's move on a little bit and get into what our experience of it was. Because, like I said, I can keep going back there. I'm always learning more. I just find it really wonderful. And and hopefully, you guys hearing that coming from someone like me, who's been to a lot of places in the world. I've been to 80 countries in the world so far. I love places like the pyramids. One of my favorite places is Pompeii. Um, just outside Naples where Vesuvius is and that's a very fascinating uh, place to visit but Machu Picchu is it's right up there as one of the top locations to go to if you like history and culture and uh, architecture and archaeology so um, on uh, on a visit um, there are a few different ways you could do that um, there is, so the main way of getting there um, for most tourists is you get a train from uh, Olean Tambo um, to um, kind of a modern, uh, it's called Machu Picchu, the town, isn't it? Um, yes. And that's where that's where everyone gathers, um, ready to get on buses to, to drive up the hill. Um, now, you can walk up that hill. It is steep and it is long and it's just a, a cut back track that goes all the way up the mountain it is mental it when it takes a long time to get up there if you take the coach you feel like you feel like you're taking your life in your hands on that coach mm -hmm. because they go so fast and it is literally a switchback mm -hmm. road crazy crazy steep and they fly around those corners like like you wouldn't believe and if you walk up it i think it's three thousand steps and the angle is about 45 or 55 degrees mm. it's very steep so get those calf muscles working yeah. get some exercise before you go otherwise you probably won't make it <laughs> there are other options you'd be pleased to know um so there are uh people talk about the sun gate um and the sun gate is you can see from the complex itself um it's right up high on a, on, on a ridge um uh and you would one of the tracks you can do is passing through the sun gate and you get this amazing view of the of the complex at dawn at dawn and they usually i mean there are different lengths of treks that you can do getting via the inca trails to that sun gate but usually they get you there for dawn so you get this incredible vista mm. assuming of course that it isn't really cloudy it is cloud forest so if you're up there and it's good visibility you're lucky mm. Um, you can do a four-day Inca Trail trek to that Sun Gate. You can do a single day and a half day. 
Um, there are more Inca trails as well. So, oh, for yeah. example, like the you've got the classic Inca, Inca trail that takes you past some of the fortresses and some really amazing architecture. And if you're going to only do, um, if you only do Machu Picchu once, then that's what I would recommend: do the classic Inca trail. But there are other trails. Um, the Laris Trail is a very beautiful trail. It takes you past amazing waterfalls and some really cool geology, and you go over a it's more than 4,000 meter peak on the Laris Trail. And when we went up there the last time, actually, it was um, they had to close it down because there was too much snow on top. So when you're uh, doing Machu Picchu, do some research on what kit you need because you will go to altitude and it will be cold. So generally, you're going to need a good sleeping bag because when you do the Inca Trail or one of the Inca Trails, you're going to spend four days or up to four days. You can do a five day Inca Trail if you're. Um, either not very fit or uh, maybe you're getting on in the years and you think, well, I'd, I'd like to be able to take my time. You can actually do that and just kind of poodle along over five days. Um, the Laris Trail is a brilliant trail. It's got incredible views of the mountains all around. Another one is a quarry trail. And the quarry trail is very cool where you get to see the quarry where a lot of the rock was quarried, obviously for Oli and Tambo and many, many uh, towns and cities in the Sacred Valley itself. And that's very cool to see. Uh, you can go in caves and there are skulls and bones and great stories along the way and also incredible views on the Quarry Trail as well. The Quarry Trail has like a mini sun gate uh, that overlooks the Sacred Valley from another angle and you get you get another perspective and you drop down from the Quarry Trail into Oli and Tambo. That also goes to altitude I guess about, I think it's around 4,100 meters. Um, just look that up to, but it is over 4,000 meters. So your guides will probably have some mules. They'll carry a lot of the equipment uh, on those mules. Obviously, they're carrying like food in the kitchen and a tent for your team to hang out in, in the evenings. But think about footwear. You're probably going to need a sturdy pair of mountaineering boots. And you're also going to need a nice like base camp jacket to keep you really warm when you get um, to base in the evenings, because it can get really cold. It's really cold. Um, if you, by the way, if you want, we have got a mountain leaders kit list. So pop us an email or a Facebook and we'll send you that. And it's got um, some really good um, tips on uh, kit. And we'll just put that over to you. And it's basically the kit that you would need if you were going to do the Inca Trail. So let's uh, move on to the kind of organisational tips of the day. Um, if you were looking at um, going to Peru generally, really. Um, so uh, it is a developing country, um, so it's important to blend in um, with your clothing. Um, leave expensive watches and, and phones at home and stay in groups of uh, minimum two and ideally, you know, six um, or more if you can. Um, there is um, quite a bit of um, cr uh, crime against, particularly against, well, yeah, tourists, but anyone anyone really. There's a lot of muggings that happen in Peru. Um, the, the place that you can go to find this kind of information is on the um, .gov travel. .gov travel. Um, and in it, it, it talks about um, uh, there are lots of uh, scams going on regarding um, taxi drivers. That's um, a big one. So um, do your research um, if you are needing transport like that. So a couple of really particular things to watch out for. Um, so the last time I went to Machu Picchu was in 2019. And so that was just pre-COVID. Josh has actually been since then. And it's quite been very interesting because the .gov uh, website, the British website, has changed a lot. And it's probably by about four pages worth of stuff. When I went there, it was actually quite a safe place to visit. But violent muggings has gone up. Mm. So I would, if I were you, I would take a disposable wallet with a little bit of cash in and a burner phone. A, either a broken phone, an old phone, so that if you get mugged, you can give those over. Buy yourself a um, 
a passport wallet, a concealable one, which goes close to your body. So you can get ones that are uh, belt wallets. We'll put some links up at some point. Um, and you can wear those under your belt and even like under your underwear or within your underwear. Yeah, it normally sits just underneath your waistline of, yeah. your, of your trousers. So if people go through your pockets and rifle through you personally, um, then it's a lot more difficult to find. And unfortunately, since I've been to uh, Cusco and Machu Picchu, um, there is a higher warning in Peru generally, especially in Cusco, uh, Arequipe and Lima. Lima's always been a bit tough, to be honest. Um, but Arequipe and Cusco have gone up high on muggings, violent uh, violence against tourists and muggings, and also what Josh said about the taxis. Unfortunately, the taxi drivers, you're now getting to violence, muggings, and also rapes from the uh, non-legitimate taxi companies or people that are operating. So when you go um, to Peru, make sure you are using legitimate taxi companies Make sure that you are doing your research on who they are before you get told, because you could get told by a scammer who then lures you into a cab and you end up in a dark street somewhere and you're in trouble. Um, it has become more serious. It's still not massively prevalent, but it is happening. So don't be one of those people. Do your research and stay protected. So uh, inevitably, if you're traveling these kind of regions, you you will make friends. So um and um you know uh, associates who can help you out with travel or anything like that be it local or a local or whoever um but just don't be too quick to trust people um there are um, some cases of people who look like they're european for example who um would target people running in scams running scams so um, in in even in Cusco, for example, so um, people would say you you'd ask them, oh, where's the nearest ATM? And they'll say, well, I'll, I'll take you, um, take you to an ATM, um, and then mug you at the ATM once as soon as you put your pin in. Yeah, and there's things like that with charitable aid. People come up to you asking for charity in different ways, and they can be Western people as well doing this, and uh, they just migrated out there to try and exploit tourists in those areas. And um, you can end up at an ATM either by force or out of the kindness of your heart. And then, you know, you can end up with some kind of uh, weapon uh, pointed at you and then you get forced into a situation. I think that's a good point. Even on um, uh, even if it's not a safety concern, um, you should be very mindful about. Um, so on the subject of begging, um, giving money to. Um, especially if they're children um, in de in any developing country, really, because um, <clears throat> if uh, a, a Westerner for tourists gives money to a child, they then take that money back home, and that increases the likelihood of of parents, really really poor families, then saying, "Well, this is better than sending my child to school," um, and that is is a growing issue. Mm. Um, so yeah you you shouldn't give money to people in that you know yeah in that way anyway there there are better ways to give to spread wealth yeah you should be thoughtful about that and also what often happens is you'll get out a wallet and you'll take out you know one or two dollars or whatever and give it to somebody and they'll then see that you've got a wallet with many more dollars in it and they'll see the contents of that i always carry uh, two wallets or purses with me one will have just a few dollars or whatever the currency is in, and then the rest of my money will be spread out, either in my pack or in my shoe or in a body belt or something like that, or all of the above. So that if if I do get robbed, possibly one, I can give away my burner stuff and hopefully they will scarf with that and I actually preserve everything that I need, or at least my stuff is split up when I, if I uh, did get into some trouble. Uh, last of all, for those kinds of things, when you go to these places, wear good shoes and tie the laces. Uh, you don't know when you might have to leave a situation rapidly. Um, so for guys and for girls, wear a good pair of shoes, walking boots, whatever, that can uh, help you to um, get out of there uh, sharpish when you need to. Yeah. 
move on, we're running out of time, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Um, I mean, it's one of our favourite places, so lots to chat about, um, and which is why we decided to break Peru up um, by region, because there's so many exciting places to talk about. Um, so we'll move on to um, Kit to try. Um, we've talked about this in previous webinars, but we, it's important to talk about again, and that's water purification. Uh, never uh, assume all water is um, is unsafe um, and always treat it. There are a few different ways of doing that. Um, one way is through um, a chemical that, that I, I personally use. Um, it's called Aquaprove um, and it's quite simple to um, to make up it's a tiny little bottle and then you just crush a pill into the bottle fill the bottle up to, to a line leave it 10 minutes and then that bottle four drips will every do will do one liter mm. um, and it lasts for quite a long time it, um, the chemical the solution itself will last for a month so usually that's plenty of time to um for your stay um I go with, uh, we've done this in the, was it webinar one? We talked about water. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah, Borneo. Yeah. What, watch webinar one on Borneo. We've actually got all the kit out on that. We're not going to um, show it again. But check that out. The SteriPen, uh, you can buy them for about 60 to 80 pounds. Uh, it's a brilliant um, way of purifying water that doesn't have any sediment in it. It kills all bacteria. And a Catadin pocket filter is another great bit of kit. That will filter out um, biological stuff, parasites, and also uh, the sediment as well. Mm -hmm. I use both. So when I'm out in the wild, the catadin is a brilliant bit of kit to mm -hmm. take um, dirty water out of the river and clean it, and then zap it with a stove pen, and that will clean it up just nicely. We'll put a post to um, webinar one so you can find that, that easily, and that's got um, you can see each item mm -hmm. that we're talking about on that. Webinar one has just been uploaded to YouTube as well. And uh, we'll chuck a link to that uh, down here so that you can have a look at that as well. Um, poncho, we already talked about Poncho. Um, why not get one? They are actually quite good for um, keeping away pickpockets because they uh, got if they've got pockets in them, it's often a big pocket on the front, on the belly, where you put both your hands in it um and you don't need to put anything in that you can actually put everything in your pockets in your shirts and and coats and things underneath the poncho and if that gets moved by a pickpocket you will feel it so that's quite a good bit of kit to get hold of the other one is the uh, backpack so um this is happening more and more all over the place people going up to backpacks with razor blades and they will cut through your backpack and because the razor blade is so sharp um, they can take stuff out of your bag. And a lot of people might be carrying a camera and some expensive stuff with them. So um, we're going to put a link in. There's a couple of backpacks out there, one made by Osprey especially, which uh, doesn't have any zips or openings on the actual back or the outward facing part of your backpack. You actually take the backpack off and the zip is against your back. So it's not attainable. Or reachable by any pickpocket links in the description check that one out there are many more like it but if you want to just uh, google it just google a uh, theft proof backpack and uh, you'll get loads of results on it it's a useful uh, thing to think about so um a little bit more about staying safe in peru um very recently uh, there's been increased uh big increase in political protests um in the last i think it was a year ago last year um, early last year, there was uh, a, a coup, I believe, um, and the um, the at the time government was removed, um, and big uh, there was a big protest in Lima itself. Um, Machu Picchu was closed down for um, a while, and then tourists that were up there at the time it closed were stranded. Um, this that kind of political situation uh flares up every now and then mm -hmm. um there are quite uh there can be violent protests or there can be um you know heavy 
um, police presence uh, that can also be quite violent. So um, it's important that you be aware of that. Um, ask uh, locals about you know what's going on at the time, um, uh, and then yeah, keep an eye on um, on the government's travel advice page for that. The best thing is to, as like I said before, have a plan. Mm. You know, when you go to Cusco, ninety nine percent of people will fly into Cusco, but there are other ways out of Cusco. Um, so have a look, have a look at the bus, get a bus timetable, and the routes have some hotels which are within a day's ride of the bus leaving Cusco and make a plan because I mean last time I was in Cusco it wasn't I wouldn't call it a civil uprising but there was a large political protest in Cusco town and where they protest where the city hall is it's in old town it's in the it's in the tourist center so you're not like detached from the the situation you're you're in the situation so if anything kicks off you would be in it in cusco if there was and they are becoming more common because there's a lot of corruption in peru and the people are standing up against it It'd be good if uh, we stood up against our corruption a bit more wouldn't it josh that'd be um that'd be good that's another web, uh, web <laughs> <in time. laughs> um but um yeah make sure that uh, you're just aware of it and their uh, plan for it as well what else have we got? So I think we could do some questions, I think. OK, here we go. Uh, do many people have problems with altitude and mountain sickness? Um, thanks, Gene. Um, is it like two, two and a half thousand metres? Yeah, so uh, I mean, Cusco itself, um, you will feel the effects of you, yeah. altitude. For the first day, you, yeah. you will a little bit. So um that's a really good point actually thanks for the question um yeah maybe hang out in uh, cusco for a day before you go to machu picchu so if there are any kind of like altitude related um sicknesses and issues you can just kind of like take a paracetamol and just relax and uh, take a nice steady stroll around the town to get used to it so yeah thank you for that um what is beneath machu picchu well it depends on what side you're on actually um Beneath Machu Picchu is a very steep uh, valley and there's uh, a river running through that and it splits. Um, and there's a there's a little town. We'll just look at that, actually. If you want to uh, Google it, uh, do so. But the town from Machu Picchu is, um, I think it's about an hour away. One of the things that a lot of people do is they, they uh, take the bus uh, down Machu Picchu and up Machu Picchu as well. And then when you get to the bottom of the mountain, a very steep mountain, there's a train ride. And the train is actually beautiful. Uh, it's got like an almost completely glass uh, roof to it. And you get a really nice kind of chilled out uh, ride along the river. Um, and that takes you to Urum Urumbamba. So Urumbamba is the river um, and it goes, um, if you've got a kind of main mountain um, of Machu Picchu, it goes around the whole mountain itself in a big arc. Right, what's the hidden museum? I don't know what that is. So let me just have a look, see if it's the one that we went to. OK, maybe you might be talking about the uh, the Casa Concha Museum. Um, if you go to Cusco, I would see all the museums. I think there are three. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I've definitely seen two of them. I think one of them was closed um, for refurbishment when all the times that I've been there. Um, they're very cool. Some of them have got some brilliant artifacts in. They've got the whole stretched skulls where they, they're elongating the, the skulls of children through some kind of custom. And people think there could be aliens. It's quite an interesting one. Um, but they're, they're really good to see. And also they give you a lot more kind of insight into the history of the, the Inca people as well. So yeah, definitely go to museums. And they're cheap. I can't remember how much they were to get in, but it was it was nothing uh, really to get into them and see some of the stuff. So definitely uh, do that. 
So from um, Cusco, there are, I mean, there's loads and loads of things you can go see from Cusco. Um, what, when you're there, what, um, all of the, the trails and all of the uh, archaeological sites, you have to you have to pay to go and see. Um, and the best way of doing that is you can buy a ticket um, that has um, all of the sites in the area. And then you can, um, every time you go to an archaeological site, they'll stamp it um, and then you can go to the next one. Mm. Um, I would highly, highly recommend um, doing part of the, uh, I'm trying to remember where it starts now. Um, it starts at some fountains, but you, there's an, uh, an Inca trail um, that comes down into Cusco via Saxai Woman. Uh, Saxai Woman was was the the kind of final stand of the of the Incas really against the Spanish. Um, it's an it's a massive citadel fortress, um, and on the way down you'll come through many different temples. There's a Temple of the Eagle um, mm -hmm. and uh, some baths as well, kind of way stations um, that the um, Inca runners would. Uh, come and rest at before um, moving on to the next settlement. All messages passed through the empire were all ran, basically, um, which is nuts because the amount of Inca trails, I think, if you added all the Inca trails up throughout all of Peru, it, it amounts to the ones that we've discovered anyway, something like 40,000 40, kilometers of worth of Inca trail. Mm -hmm. And that's just the ones that haven't been reclaimed by the jungle. Um, and they would use. Um, they would take eat coca leaf um, and that will give you energy and also help with altitude sickness. That's something that the locals do. Um, yeah. But coming down this trail through um, the Temple of the Eagle and um, other sites, you finally come to Saxai Woman. Um, where, so I think you know a bit more about the, how the, con, the place was constructed than I do. It is humongous. Have a look at some photos. Um, but the the stones that was that were made, I want to I'm gonna hesitate by say made. I think maybe you you know a bit more about this. I mean, there's some crazy um, conjecture on this. So I'm I'm a geologist by trade, so I like rocks. Um, but a lot of people, um, there are some ideas that um, the rocks are actually formed in different ways through like semi melting and molding and all kinds of things like that. Um, we, I'm not going to talk about it actually because we're running out of time. But because um, Paul's got a really good question that I uh, want to talk about, but um, check it out again. It's just one of the other sites. I mean, we spent the first half now just talking about some basic history of Machu Picchu without even going into much detail. All of these sites have deep history, mm. and because it's not that old, there's a lot to learn. So go check it out. Let's do uh, Paul's question, which is a really good one. He says, how do you go about finding and de uh, developing mutually beneficial, respectful, reliable relationships with local contacts? That's a brilliant question. Um, we can probably help you with that. So if you do um, want to contact somebody, we have a great one. Our main contact is the son of the head of the archaeological uh, development from the museums in Cusco who opened up. Machu Picchu in the 1970s. He's a head architect, uh, um, archaeologist there, and his son was one of our guides. Now, I met him through a lot of research where I went on the internet looking for ethical guiding companies to help me with my uh, planning of the trips. So that's what I would do if I were you. I would go to companies that are believed or have ethical uh, recognition from international organizations like UNICEF um, or even the Red Cross and things like that. You can find them. They are there and they operate honestly with integrity. And then once you use that kind of company or those people, you can then um, say, can you help me with this? Even just where's a good bar to go to? Where's a good restaurant to go to? And they'll be more than happy to help you with that. And if you've got a bit of money, you could even ask them to guide you around Cusco City. In that, definitely spend a good bit of time in Cusco City. And I would uh, encourage all of you to go check out 
the Emperor Incas Hotel in Cusco itself. It's, it's the highest five-star hotel in the city, and you can get one of the best meals you'll ever have in your life for about 30 quid. Um, you can also hire the spa to yourself for like 150 pounds. So if you're going there with a group, there's a wonderful spa with a pool, saunas, steam rooms, hot beds. Very, very, very cool. And you can actually book a slot to hire the entire place for an hour. And last time I was there, it was about £150 for that slot, for that one hour. So if you've got a bunch of people with you, it, it's well worth it to go and enjoy yourself at the Emperor's Hotel in Cusco. So check that one out as well. Okay, I think that's... <clears throat> We're about there for questions. I do want to say one more thing, which is um, I wrote down that restaurant, didn't I? Where did I put that? Let me just uh, let me just grab it if it's there. Uh, when you go to the main square in, in uh, Cusco, there's loads of restaurants, and many of them are really good. And um, some of the food there is really unbelievable, um, really, really nice. So do a bit of research you can just check out the five-star restaurants around that square and again because of the, your currency exchange you're going to get a lot for your money even if you spend a fair amount of money uh, you're going to get a really good experience so have a look at some of those restaurants they really well cater to um vegan and vegetarian as well because a lot of their traditional meals are kind of salads potatoes and vegetable based and then fish is uh, the other thing. And then if you want to go cheaper, just go to any of the Brazilian chicken outlets where they do fried chicken. Right. And on that note, I think we might have to leave it there. So um, thanks for um, joining us for our third webinar on Machu Picchu. Um, we've got the next one coming out um, next month. We will be in the Arctic for for that one we are going to do it on live from the arctic so we're going to try we'll see how it goes tech wise but we're going to try and do it uh inside a quincy shelter which would be very cool um we'll we see if we can get reception so that's something that we're going to explore if not we'll um we'll do it um yeah somewhere else but um and we'll um check out the polaris outdoor youtube channel because yes. we've just put our first webinar on on Josh's article on being injured in remote and cold places is also up on the blog spot on the website. So you can have a look at that. And thank you for hanging out with us today. And we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.